when people talk about building leadership effectiveness, the focus is usually on skills. And we can we talk a lot about valuable skills on this show, but often what is underappreciated is the role of habits. Um, today, we're going to change that. We're going to talk uh, about habits and heighten and highlight the role of habits and what they have to our success as an individual, as a leader. And we're actually going to identify some of the most powerful ones that you can exhibit. Welcome to another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast, where we are helping leaders grow personally and professionally to lead more effectively and make a bigger difference for their teams, organizations, and the world. If you're listening to this podcast in the future, you could join us when we are live, which could give you access to this information sooner. And you can watch live in the future on your favorite social channel. So if you'd be interested in doing that, you just need to join one of these two groups, either our Facebook group or our LinkedIn group. You can do that to get information about when we're live and other information about the show by going to remarkablepodcast.com slash Facebook or remarkablepodcast.com slash LinkedIn. Simple as that. Today's episode is brought to you by our Remarkable Master Classes. Pick from 13 important life and leadership skills to help you become more effective, productive, and confident while overcoming some of a leader's toughest challenges. Learn more and sign up at remarkablemasterclass.com. Our guest today, you see him beside me if you're watching. Uh, our guest today is William Vanderblom. Vanderblomen. That's how I've been saying it in my head. Am I right? Pretty close. I've been called a lot worse. It's well, okay. Like well, you say it. You say it the way it needs to be said, and then I'll introduce you. Well, I'll say it the way the Americans have said it. I don't know how it was said over in you know the Netherlands, but Vander Blumen, like flowers. Vander Blumen. So that was my second choice in my head. Vander Blumen. William Vander Blumen is our guest. He's yeah, been I only know that because I, you know, somehow during middle school it got out that it's like flower boy is pretty much the name so that, that oh, didn't work so well yeah that yeah. sounds like a very middle school sort of thing uh <laughs> william has been leading the vanderbloom and search group for 15 years where they are regularly retained to identify the best talent for teams manage succession planning and consult on all issues regarding teams this year they will complete their 3000th executive search i bet by now they've done that prior to founding this company the vanderbloom and search group he studied executive search under a mentor with 25 years of executive search experience at the highest levels. His learning taught him the very best corporate practices, including search strategies used by the internationally known firm, Russell Reynolds. Prior to that, he served as senior pastor at one of the largest Presbyterian churches in the United States. And now he is the author of this fabulous new book, Be the Unicorn, 12 Data-Driven Habits that Separate the Best Leaders from the Rest. That's the title of this episode. And that is our guest, William. Welcome. Glad to have you. Thanks, Kevin. Super glad to be with you and uh, appreciate you having me on. Uh, it's my pleasure. So that intro says, uh, well, we already heard about your middle school uh, scenario, uh, but that that intro tells us a little bit about your journey. Like you're in executive search and have been for a long time, but before that you were a pastor. So uh, I don't need you to tell us your whole life story, but I would like to know like how you and how you went from that being a pastor <laughs> to doing this. Like tell us a little bit about that last stage of this journey? Well, I think it actually, the last stage is just a, a bookend to the first stage. And the first stage is growing up as a kid, I was always the one with an entrepreneurial bent or an idea. You know, I was the paper boy back when you had to do that, which was a fabulous job that we've lost uh, as times have changed. But, uh, you know, it, it, I'm eight years old. I had to keep my own P&L. I had to do my own collections. I had to, I mean, it's amazing. Uh, but I, I uh, actually bought out the routes around me and then redistributed the densities and sold them back off to other paper boys. And that's the picture of, of young me that took a long, windy road and now ended up back in sort of an entrepreneurial thing, uh, trying to help uh, a, a part of the world that I spent part of my career in. So uh, did a prodigal journey in college. I was really good at that. I, I, I know everything my daughters better not bring home uh, in a date. And then uh, kind of got back on track and that included a spiritual journey. And that led to, well, I guess I should try and help others find this kind of wonderful life change. So went into the pastorate, didn't want to. I thought pastors just sat around in robes all week with 
bad hair and ask people for money. And I no, you know, uh, but uh, had a chance to serve some really great people was probably always a little too entrepreneurial for the, the more established part of churches. Um, went through a divorce, which I would not recommend, but that left me as a single dad with four kids and having to figure out how to kind of pivot in life. Um, wasn't in any shape to get, give anybody spiritual guidance. I was just trying to put my life back together and I went to work for an oil and gas company. Because uh, you're in Houston, why not? Well, that's the thing, right? <laughs> I, I had a lot of friends in the business. One of them runs or was on the lead team at a Fortune 200 company. And he said, come work for us. And I said, I don't know anything about all that. He said, yeah, but you know people. So we'll put you in HR for a year and we'll teach you the business and then we'll rotate you around and so forth. So during that year, the CEO decided I need to find my successor. He'd been there nine and a half years, which is a lifetime for a CEO of a Fortune 200 company. Uh, they hired this thing called a search firm. I'd never heard of it. It was a brand new idea to me. And since I was brand new on the HR team, I was on the succession team, which air quotes means I was kind of the water boy. <laughs> Nothing but you got me. to learn a bunch of stuff. But I got to Catch watch a lot into of the stuff. search business. Basically. Yeah, that's right. And 90 days after they started, they had a new CEO. And that is not the way the church works, Kevin. First Press Houston, where I first Presbyterian Houston, where I was, which was in the small world of Presbyterianism, kind of a big thing. Uh, they took three years to find me. I was there six. They took three years to find the next guy. So 12 years, half with somebody, half looking. Half with somebody, half without somebody, right? That's crazy. No company can begin to endure that. All the momentum that would be lost. And so when I saw the business solution, I thought, well, why doesn't the church have a as good a solution as a bit? I know the church world. Maybe I can help them get a little bit more efficient in how they run things. And I, I went home and... Adrian and I had just gotten married uh, a few months prior. We'd blended our families with six kids, a house we could barely afford, really no money at all. And I said, Adrian, I think I'm, I think I'm supposed to quit my job and start something new for churches. And, and she, she said, looked, awesome, I'm sure. You know, she said, um, even better. She's smart. Um, bad taste in men, but smart. Uh, she said, oh, oh, that's because churches love new ideas right? Said no one ever in the history of ever, right? Uh, and and Kevin, the kicker is uh, it was the fall of 2008. So if you're, if you're younger listeners, if that doesn't compute, just Google 2008 economy. Yeah, you'll figure it out. <laughs> it's yeah. like the right. stupidest time in the world to quit your job and try and start a new business. But off we went. Now, 15 years later, we've had... Uh, more good fortune than I ever could have deserved. And I've got a team that's smarter than I am. And uh, we've gotten to help a lot of people. It's grown past helping churches to helping schools, nonprofits, and then values-based businesses. But as a long story, sorry, I'm a, I'm a recovering preacher. I, I ramble. So um, you did some research in, so you've been doing this for 15 years, 12 years at the time. Yep. maybe, And uh, you, you, you had some time during COVID and uh, decided to do some research around, like, we're trying to find this great talent for folks. And right. like, how do we, how can we figure out who the, what is it that makes those people the best folks? You call That's them right. unicorns. So like, tell us about how you did this research yeah. uh, that got us yeah. to this to this idea and to this book. Well, it's, you're just spot on, Kevin. I mean, like we get paid by companies to go find their next unicorn, go find the mythical, wonderful candidate that'll be able to do it all. That's what, that's why people hire us. Right. And we've gotten pretty good at spotting them, but every now and then I've missed one, you know, I've underestimated somebody in an interview. And then other times, I, I don't know if you ever have this happen, but within five minutes of meeting somebody, you're like, this person's amazing. This one's different. I should hire them. And that's not necessarily the right. So, so how do you, figure out what is it that that unique chemistry when people grab you within five minutes and what is it that you can look for so that you don't miss somebody who might fly under radar. These are the questions in my mind and I've never had time to answer them. Pandemic shuts down all of our clients, all of them. A business lesson I learned since I don't have a business degree. If all of your clients close indefinitely, 
your calendar and your P&L will change that year. <laughs> so, so fortunately the, the P&L we were able to work out, but, but the calendar, I was able to sit back and say, well, let's, let's talk about this. Let's study. So we realized in a, in a search, there are hundreds, if not thousands of people that might come under consideration. But when you get to the bottom of the funnel, the very best of the best, the last eight or 10, and they've been through several virtual interviews already, then we get on a plane and we go sit down with them for a long face-to-face -face interview. And we keep pretty meticulous notes. So these are the best of the best. And during the pandemic, we realized we've now done 30,000 of those face-to-face -face interviews. And we have all of the data on what they interviewed like, how they behaved, how their career's gone, that sort of thing. And so could we figure out if these are the unicorns, could we figure out the best of those? And we found them. And then we said, you know, do they have anything in common so we can learn how to spot a unicorn? The cool thing is the research came back uh, super clear and super surprising. Uh, surprising on two fronts. One, it was not the list I thought it'd be. I thought it would be the smartest people, the best educated people, the best looking people, whatever the, you know, quarterback and the head cheerleader, that sort of thing. No, um, it was habits, as you mentioned in the front of the show, habits that these people seem to bend toward almost innately, sometimes frenetically. And they're habits that were really common among unicorns and completely uncommon among most everybody else on the planet. And, and, and then the second surprise in the research was these habits are actually teachable, coachable, learnable. So I went off on a selfish project to figure out how to spot unicorns faster or not miss any that go by so I could be a better search guy. What I found was here's a roadmap that I need to share with people so they can stand out in the crowd and they can become one of those people that in five minutes, people are like, this one's special. And, right. and I, it, that's why we wrote a book. We didn't write a book to make money. That's for sure. Um, but we felt like this is a resource that could help people because, Kevin, it's noisier than ever out there right now. It's hard to stand out. So we're talking with William Vanderblumen, the author of the book, Be the Unicorn, 12 Data-Driven Habits that Separate the Best Leaders from the Rest. What I'm going to do, William, is it, there's no way that in the time that we have left that we can talk about all 12 of these habits. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read them really quickly. Then I'm going to ask you two or three questions. And then I'm going to sure. pick a couple for us to chat about. How about that? Uh, we didn't good. have the chance to talk about this ahead of time. So I'm just giving you a little heads up where I'm headed. No, that's all good, um, man. So here are the 12. And I'm just going to say them all to you relatively quickly. Uh, if you're listening to this, you can stop at any point to write them down if you want to. But you should also just go copy, buy a copy of the book. Um, here are the 12. Uh, the unicorns are the fast, the authentic, the agile, the solver, the anticipator, the prepared, the self-aware, the curious, the connected, the likable, the productive, and the purpose-driven. That's the 12 uh, that we promised you at the front end of this situation. So now, both from your research and from your observation, I know that you've identified one that you think is the most important of the 12. We're gonna get we're gonna get back to the fact that they're learnable and teachable and coachable and all that, uh, but uh, which one is the most important? Yeah, well, two answers. One, it depends on what job you're doing, and two, um, if everything else is equal and you don't have a job, I'd say self awareness. So, so, you know, so from your perspective, what does self awareness? mean and then let's dive into that the two of us for a sec yeah uh, i don't i don't know your history well enough kevin if the podcast is the podcast that you're doing the first time you heard your voice recorded no 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 okay not even okay close. well do you remember the first time you heard your voice recorded and you're like that is yeah, not like how i sound 50 years ago but yes of course it's not it's you're not like, the way it sounds in our ears for sure no that's not me that's some other get a new microphone right that's self-awareness like i don't know a simpler way to put it uh, how we see ourselves is fundamentally flawed <laughs> because we're we don't we can't even see ourselves we're seeing out our own eyes our best chance is a reflection right so what we found was we so we identified all the unicorns and then we said, OK, unicorns, will you let us survey you? Yes, we will. So we did. We found that uh, 
we, we asked them to force rank. Like, what's your top habit of these 12? What are you best at? The, the least popular number one gift, the least common among unicorns is self-awareness. Okay. Now, I think part of the reason it's the least common is because they are unicorns and they know they really need to learn themselves and don't know. Right? I think that's right. Like the research says that 90% of 90% of the population say they're, they are self-aware, but like most aren't. Right? Oh, so, you, so it's interesting. I don't know where you pulled your stat, but it's spot on. We, we surveyed a quarter million people after surveying the unicorns, 93% of them said they were above average yeah. at yeah. self-awareness. Like, I don't have a math degree, but I don't think that adds up. Well, you know, like 80% of American men think they're above average drivers too, which takes us back to the whole self-awareness thing as well. So, so I I think that fact alone is super interesting because among this self-selected group, it was the least selected item. And yet in the general population, your data, and I've seen other research, 90 plus percent of people think they're above average of being self-aware. Yeah. And, well, and so that that discrepancy alone, like sort of mic drops this whole show, I suppose, in some way. But I, I have a religion and philosophy degree behind me, and I never thought it'd come in handy in business. And if you're going to go in business, I would not suggest majoring. In Don't people. start there. No, no, no. I That's a different podcast. But, you know, Socrates, maybe the maybe the father of, of Western philosophical thought. Didn't write much down. There's a lot of debate about what he actually taught and didn't teach. The one thing people don't debate is his cornerstone teaching was one sentence. Know yourself. Yep. People don't want to do that. They don't like you ever do a 360 at work. How fun is that? I don't want to hear that. Right. But and yet I could argue. And in fact, I will be on a webinar tomorrow uh, arguing that that's the single best place to start. We well, we actually built leaders. a software tool, like a unicorn index people can take and they, they can take it as a team in a 360 fashion so they can learn. Oh, I think I'm good at these three. My colleagues and my boss think I'm better at these three. So it gives you a path of development. But most people don't want to take that time. I, you know, as in my previous life as a pastor, I'd hear these scripture verses and they mean one thing to me. And now I'm like, oh, maybe there's even more. Like Jesus was talking to people at one point and said, look, don't don't worry about the splinter in your brother's eye, get the log out of your own first. And I thought this was like, judge, not lest you be judged, or you don't know what hard time another person's going through or something like that. I wonder if there's not an additional layer here now that says, hey, until you, William, until you get to know your own issues, you will not be able to help others. You're just not going to be able to. So if, if I could have all things equal, you don't have a job and it's not job specific, I would say uh, self-awareness is the one I would work on. And it's the easiest one to start with. You can go take our index or you can take a disk inventory or an Enneagram. Just get, it's the best age ever to get to know yourself. And uh, it might be the thing that leads to the most improvement. Uh, my favorite one is, it's called the fast in the book. It really probably should be called the responsive. The ones who get back to people quickly. That to me is the easiest upgrade in your habits. By the way, it's very clear it's your favorite if you read the book. Like, it's pretty clear that it's your favorite. Just say it. That did not surprise me. So well, fast, I, fast the it, responsive. I, I, it's just so freaking easy. If you just get back to people, you will separate yourself from the crowd. Salespeople don't follow up on leads. People on eHarmony don't follow up on I would like to meet you. Like, like that's why you're here. Mind. <laughs> that's right lonely people on a website don't get back to each other like we are horrible at this and if you just flip the switch to say i'm going to get right back to people first chance i can you will stand out in the crowd and you can work on your self-awareness too there's there's another one on the list and again i i read the list to everybody very very quickly uh, there's another one on the list that I, I believe is connected to the fast and so draw the connective tissue for us between the fast or as you now said, maybe it should have been the responsive and the productive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, the ability to have bias for action is very uncommon among people. Most people put things off like the old, again, the religion and philosophy degree, the old Latin word that means tomorrow is literally the word crastina. 
So Which is- when you put it off for tomorrow, you procrastinate. This is as old as we are. And, and most people do that. I, you know, here's the connective tissue. I'm 27 years old. I'm a young pastor at this church in Alabama. And uh, they brought me in while they're in the middle of relocating. So they didn't have a venue. We had to find places to be. We outgrew the space we were in. Our building wasn't going to be ready for a year. I needed to find a new spot. I'm riding around with a friend of mine who used to be on the board and had left the church. And I was trying to woo him back. And we drove around, had lunch, drove me back over to the office. And he said, you know, there's a YMCA right across the street from our property that we're building on. And I don't think they use it on Sundays. I said, wow. He said, yeah, maybe we can meet there. I said, cool. He said, I know the board chair. I'm like, great. He said, let me write down here. Here's his number. Okay, cool. So we stand around and talk for about 10 minutes. And he looks at me and says, why haven't you called the board chair yet? (laughs) And I said, well, Todd, I'm sitting here talking to you. I thought he said, no, 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 no. You hadn't called him yet because you've already put it off. The first chance to get something done is always the best chance to get something done. That might be turning left in a heavy traffic. The first chance you get is the one. But but we as people, our research shows, we're prone to put things off. We're prone to hit the snooze button. When what in the world does seven minutes of sleep do for me except throw off whatever REM cycle I had? Like, just get it done. And uh, the people that have that bent for action are the ones that are, don't don't ever get fired. Like, who do you ask if you want something to get done? The busiest person you know, because they've figured out I'm going to be productive. And it's not hard. It's just a matter of actually following through with developing a habit. And that's why I, one of the things I love about the book and about the research is that you frame them as habits. Um, and, and, and we could talk about them as skills. There are skills inside of each of these habits and it, because it's a skill, as you've already alluded to, it's learnable and it's coachable and we can build them. Uh, and so I, I love that, that you frame them though, as habits, because ultimately it doesn't matter if we have the skill, it only is if we do it. Right. And that's what I love yeah. about it. I want to talk a little bit about another, I, I thought about a couple that perhaps like if, if, no one that's listening would be surprised that being connected would be on this list. No one on this would be surprised to hear that they're solvers, right? But what people might be surprised is when um, you hear this idea of being the anticipator. What do you mean by that? Because I, I'm not sure people will think about this one as a habit, which is why I'd like you to unpack this one just yeah. a sec. Well, each of the each of the habits um, and are a chapter in the book, and each chapter has a, here's a case study in an anticipator, here's what we learned from the unicorns, and here's how you can apply this to your life. So you're not going to read this book and say, William's going to cure cancer. No, that's not the point of the book. It's simple steps toward uh, becoming a unicorn, right? And the anticipator uh, was a really interesting one because... Well, most people don't think ahead, and it's just not that hard to think one or two steps ahead. You talk to Tiger Woods about how he's going to hit his drive on the tee. He says, well, where's the pin? Well, the the green's three full shots away. Why do you care where the pin is? That's going to affect where my third shot comes in from and my second shot takes off from and my first shot lands. So where's the pin? Like, that's the difference. It's just a habit of saying what's... You don't have to see five years into the future to be ahead of the crowd. You only have to see a half step ahead. There's a, there's a, not to go all, you know, scriptural, but this whole project has made me rethink a lot of the things that I've learned over the years. There's a word in the, in the Hebrew scriptures where King David says, oh, your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. And I used to think that meant like xenon headlights that could see a mile down the road. He, He wasn't talking about that at all. He was talking about tiny little lanterns that people would tie on their shoes and it gave them enough light for the next step. That's all. And then the next step. And boy, did we learn that during the pandemic. How did you stay ahead in business? You didn't have to see how this was going to end. You had to stay half a step ahead. And, And people can learn to do that. It's just a shift in thinking. And when you get that shift and you start to think, well, now, how do I anticipate? Man, 
then you're thinking differently. And, and we don't think that way. We, we are like, you know, sheep that just look down at the next tough to grass, or maybe a sheep of the opposite gender. That's about all they're interested in. And they end up walking off cliffs. You know, we, we as a people, and we've gotten lazier as time has gone on. Back in the ancient times, Greek and Latin, word order in a sentence didn't matter at all because every word had an ending that told you exactly what it was doing. And the verb for the sentence didn't come to the end of the sentence. So you had to listen to the entire sentence before you knew what was going on. You had to think, I got to anticipate, not just act on the one thing that I just heard. And, and I think in an age of more divided attention than ever, this one's one that will separate people. Uh, you know, when you got to check 15 social media platforms to check your messages, like, no, think ahead a little bit. We could have a whole conversation about that. Like, don't do that. But that's a whole another that's issue. a whole different thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I can't have you on here with all this experience at search and all this experience with interviewing, because I'm sure a lot of people are now saying, OK, so how do I. You've now given us a, a roadmap and not only to think about ourselves, but to think about who I'm going to add to my team. Yeah. And so uh, th this could be a whole conversation, I know. Uh, and I, I, I would be remiss to not ask you to give us a couple ideas about how to how to do a better job of finding these or sussing these people out from yeah. the list. So yeah. give us a couple or three things that people can take home on in this area, because I think it's it, it's 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 important that we talk about it because this is your life's work. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what I'm learning uh, from my own mistakes as a younger leader and interviewer. I I had a propensity early on just to hire talent. That's not helpful. Just talent is not helpful. I had a propensity early on to hire people I liked, and I thought that meant they were great. Well, actually, as a young leader, turns out I liked them because they were like me, and I like me. <laughs> We end up in a room full of me. So maybe we're coming full circle to your first question about habits, most important one. Before you ever interview somebody new to come into your organization, do you have a full grasp on your organization? Are you, are you clear in your self-awareness on what we need on the team? Like, finally, I was old enough when I started this 15 years ago to say, I need some really high detail people around me or we're never, this book would not have been possible had I not known that because we wouldn't have had people that would have kept records, right? Took me a long time to learn that. And then when I'm interviewing now, when we were smaller and you know it was eight, 10 people, we hired around our cultural values. If you match these, that's fine. Now that we're bigger, I have to learn that I'm interviewing for a marketing position or a sales position that requires strength in a certain set of habits more than maybe a chief compliance officer or you know, bookkeeper or that sort of thing. Values so, still matter, but I have to think beyond just the values. That's right. I've got to think about how are you going to fit the team? So I would say the beginning is self-awareness. You know, what are, what are you uh, needing? Where do you guys as a team flourish the best? Who are your five best hires and why were they great? Go look for that again. You know, it's, it's uh, if, you, if you are clear on your cultural values, you can use those. We wrote a whole book on that, but uh, I would say being self-aware and not being blinded by talent would be my two uh, two best tips. And then, you know, Kevin, when people do this, I don't do searches anymore. I write books and speak and that sort of thing. We've got far more talented people doing the searches. But every now and then when we're doing one for an old client or a really complex deal where I have to be involved, um, I spend my time interviewing candidates by saying, hey, don't bother telling me your life story. I've already heard that. Like, what questions can I answer for you about this job? That may be the best interview question I've ever stumbled on. Because people see it as disarming and interviewing is high anxiety. So anytime you can lower anxiety, that's a huge win. They so say it, it again. So people that were, yeah. were doing yeah. something else, they're like, underline it for people, say it again. Yeah, sure. Kevin, you're interviewing with us. Uh, you've already given us your life story. Like we're, this is a, your third interview. Let's not waste time with that. How about the best way we could use the time today is for you to ask me questions about this job or working at this company. How can I help you? What can I answer? 
and just hearing you'll hear if they're not prepared you'll hear if you'll they're hear not if they're curious. not curious you'll hear if they're not connected you'll hear if they don't know themselves right um I, you know there's a lot of talk about work life balance and not being a toxic and abusive boss and I'm all for everybody being healthy but there are some jobs that require immediate responsiveness like if you are an ambulance driver <laughs> <laughs> and the call comes in, you don't get to say, but I'm having dinner with my wife and I'm trying to protect my work life balance. No, you know, <laughs> so like figure out what's essential to the job and, and see if they're asking the questions that will let you say they're going to be good at this. So I'd see what questions are inside people and I'd make sure you know yourself well enough to know, is this going to fit or not? I love that. So a couple of things before we finish, uh, William and, 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 one of them is I'm going to shift gears. Really, um, we started talking about you, and we're going to kind of end talking about you. And so, here's my next question: What do you do for fun? Yeah, well, that's changed over the years. We have seven kids. Uh, I grew up playing golf. I played with one of my four grandparents at least once a week, and played a lot of tournament golf. Never world class, but but pretty good. Uh, I functionally quit when we started the business because it's been growing every year and up and to the right, seven kids, you know. Uh, so I'm starting to have some time to do that. And that's led my wife, who plays tennis, to say, I'll learn golf if you'll learn tennis. So now I'm painfully trying to learn a very difficult sport. I'm not any good at it at all. You couldn't just have her go pickleball? Uh, maybe a well, little that's simpler? The, that's the third option. And we both agreed we're neither one of us are going to try to get good at that. We're just going to go have fun with it. All right. There you go. Uh, and the other thing that I normally, uh, that I like to ask everybody that I've met, I mean, actually in my entire life, this is something that I've asked people. And when I started doing this podcast 400 and some odd episodes ago, I thought it'd be a good thing to ask people here. So I'm going to ask you, you didn't know I'm going to ask this. So um, the question is, what are you reading or what's something you've read recently? You know, I love history and biographies. I don't think it's hard to see. And usually I should say, I read biographies of people who've been dead for a while, uh, just to give it a little time. As much as you'd like to see the Britney book on my bookshelf, it's not there, right? So, um, and, neither is, and neither is the Elon Musk biography, even though Walter Isaacson is my favorite biographer of all time. Uh, so actually the, the most recent read I finished uh, was his Einstein biography, which was fascinating. I just, if you learn enough history, you can start to see the future. It's pretty cyclical. So I, I'm kind of a history biography geek. We have a you know, book challenge at home every year to read 35 books. And then I go and pick a 1200 page James Michener or Walter Isaacson. And I'm, I'm last place. I don't, I read a lot, but. <laughs> well, maybe you should go on pages and not books. There you uh, go. See, there you go. Um, I've read all the Michener, all the, so I don't need to read any more of those anymore. That was a long I think I've read every single one. The easier ones are the short ones, like Kent State, you know, not so long. Yeah. Um, Kent State as opposed to Hawaii, Centennial, or. Yeah, State. well, the, the Covenant. The is Covenant, exactly. Pretty amazing. I've read that before I made our first trip to South Africa. And yeah, so I'm a history biography nerd. So uh, the question you probably most wanted me to ask from the beginning is where can people learn more? Where do you want to point people? How yep. can they get a copy of this fabulous book, Be the yep. Unicorn? Well, the one well, stop data driven shop. habits separate it. the best leaders from the rest. Thanks, Kevin. The, the best uh, one stop shop is theunicornbook.com. Theunicornbook.com. That's got, you can find the personality assessment, you can find bonus material, you can find the book, where to order, and links for everything. The easier way to find the book is to go to Amazon and spell Vanderblumen however you would like to, because my name is so messed up, it will source right back to my author page and you'll see it right at the top. Same with Google. If you want to find our website, there are like 4,000 free resources there, just Vanderblumen, however you want to spell it, it's vanderblumen.com. Uh, you'll get there and hopefully you'll find some things that can help you out. So before we go, everyone, I have a question that I ask all of you as listeners or viewers every single week. And if you've watched before or listened before, you know, here it is. Now what? What action are you going to take? 
Like, what's the point if you don't do something with what you learned? And maybe you got an idea about how to be better prepared for the next time you're interviewing or being interviewed. Or perhaps one of the various ideas that we talked about around one of these habits is the place that you are led to start. Perhaps it's to think about how you can be work on being more self-aware, being more curious, being more of an anticipator, or perhaps it just might be getting a copy of this book. Whatever it is, the reality is that unless you take some action from this, it will have been a very little real value to you uh, when it's all said and done. William, thank you so much for being here. It was a pleasure to have you. Um, thanks again so much for being here. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate it. And thanks for having me on. So everybody, that's the end of this week's episode. You know we'll be back, so you should be back. If you're a subscriber, it will show up in your feed. If you're not, this is your chance to subscribe. If you are a subscriber and like what you get here, this is your chance to tell someone else to join us next week for the next episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast.